So here it says pursuing peace with all. That's all people. And we're going to do it on the highway of holiness because it often feels like with this girl's experience, like fire raining down and it ain't the fire of the Holy Ghost. It's a fire of persecution and criticism coming at us or false accusations. I was talking to a good friend right now who's under so much stress because there's false accusations coming against him. And it's been a really long time and, and he's getting worn down. He's getting battle fatigued. And, and in the midst of that, the, the enemy would love us to just lash out at people out of our flesh. And then that becomes a bigger problem than the original thing that we were dealing with in the first place, right? So you know how the Bible says that if you don't rule your spirit, you're like a city with the walls broken down. You're open to attack. So let's just make a declaration. We will rule our spirits. We will not be attacked by the enemy. The Lord is my defense. And he's a shield around about me. Amen. He is. So when you feel like this is all coming down on your shoulders, we still stay in that secret place with the Lord under the shadow of the Almighty. That's where we're safe. When we get in our flesh, we step out. So what we talk about a lot with deliverance and all the different topics that Trish has been going over and, and, being, and having great discernment, so much of that has to do with the way we respond to people. And when you respond out of your flesh, that often will be uh, a, a, an example of where that crack is in our foundation. And the good news is that Jesus heals those cracks. Uh, often, though, we have to look under the surface for what the root of the problem is. All we're seeing is, is that we lost our temper or we got in the flesh or we have self-hatred for, for whatever reason. And we don't always know why. So what we do week in and week out and what we said right from the very beginning when we started the church is that this was going to be an important thing uh, as a cornerstone of our church is that we want to grow people up to be emotionally healthy and, and, and to be awakened in their spirit. And because I've been in the workforce all these years and, and in management much of that time training people, I've often been able to, to build in the biblical concepts right into the training I was doing. I just didn't use King James language, but it's the truth, right? And the truth works better in business than any other con games that are going on. So that's what I'm going to focus on. And the verses that you can look at are Hebrews 12, 14. It says, pursue peace, right? Pursue is an active word. I'm, I'm chasing after peace with some people. <laughs> See, oh man, bummer. All people. I have to pursue it with all people and holiness without which no one will see the Lord. And then what Easter quoted in prayer before, a great road will go through that once de deserted land, and it will be named the Highway of Holiness. And if you look at the seven verses before verse 8, it's all talking about the desolation being restored. And, and you, can't, you can't use your own self-control or your willpower to stop you from reacting in the flesh. It's got to be Holy Spirit. It's got to be yielding to the Spirit of God inside us. And it's a supernatural power, and I use it often, but I think it's a good, apt example. When David was about to go kill Nabal and his whole household, Abigail intercepted him on the road. That's Holy Spirit. As you're starting to bubble up with that volcano and you're ready to explode, Holy Spirit will come and say, don't do this. You're about to make a really bad mistake. Don't let your flesh win right now. All right? So... That's this highway of holiness by being able to be submitted to Holy Spirit, living, I will call it a fasted lifestyle, where you pray, you fast often. Every time your flesh tries to rise up, you recognize you're saying, no, no, you're not going to win. I, I put my flesh down, and my spirit man is going to rule me because it's a hard enough battle if, we're, if we are praying, never mind if we're not praying and we're not prioritizing this. And then a similar Verse in Romans says, if it's possible, as far as it depends on you, Joe Bellata, you live at peace with everyone. And the way we translate that is, it's my half of the equation. If I'm having an issue with somebody, I can do everything I can do on my half of the equation. If they don't respond, it won't be because I didn't try. And, and if we all do that all the time, things go better. Because often the fact that you were trying to pursue the peace, even if the person was initially rejecting you, they have a, a night to sleep on it. And, you know, the Bible does say that he poured out his spirit on all flesh. 
So don't you know that sometimes people don't know it could be a prompting of the Lord when they're feeling that tug to apologize to you or say, if, if you watch the movie a Hacksaw Ridge and you know the theme of it, that this man was being persecuted because he wouldn't carry a gun and the sergeant or whoever was commanding officer said, you know, I was all wrong about you. I thought you were a coward and I found out you're the bravest man in the whole division. That's amazing, right? Just amazing. That could be a prompting of the Lord in a person who's not even saved. Because there's a conscience in people. We need to tell them who that is. It's not the unknown God. It's the Holy Spirit. All right, 2 Corinthians. We all know this verse. It's popular. I'm reading a different translation. Because of what God has done, we have a new perspective. We used to show regard for people based on how much money they had, how educated they were, right, on worldly standards. But under this life now, we don't do that any longer, right? No longer. And it says we even used to think of the anointed the same way. And you could think what that would mean. Based on worldly standards, on the surface, Jesus would have looked like uh, he died on the cross. What kind of king dies on a cross? And if you didn't know he resurrected or you didn't believe he really resurrected, because that would be a hard thing to believe, then it's like, oh, no, he's just another failed rebellion. No, no, he's alive. So we don't look at him the way we used to look at him before as some distant God. No, he's alive and he's ready to talk to us. Therefore, if Josh White is a Christian now, he's a new creation. I can't look at him the way I used to look at him. I can't apply worldly standards to him. I have to say, because he's in Christ now, he gets a third chance, a fourth chance, a fifth chance. How many? Seven times 70, 490. I'll forgive you again because... I want you to forgive me in the areas that I'm failing in. Judge not. It's the same measure that you judge others. It's going to be measured back to you, and none of us wants to be judged, right? That's a horrible place to be. And then it says, the old life is gone, and a new life has begun. All this is a gift from God, our creator, who has pursued us. There's that word again. So just like we're supposed to pursue peace with all people, and why am I talking about this as it relates to deliverance and inner healing, is because our flesh doesn't like this. <laughs> our flesh doesn't like to pursue peace with other people. We like to hold grudges, and that gives place to the enemy. How many know that verse about not going to sleep with your, with your anger when you're married? Don't let the sun go down on your anger. How many nights have you stayed up till 4 o'clock trying to get that thing resolved so you would <laughs> go to sleep before? With that anger on your heart, right? Stop that clock. Let's, let's do a Joshua and stop that clock. <laughs> so he restored us. Oh, I love it. And brought us into a restored, healthy relationship with him. So when Trisha and I were starting the church, we said, you know, there were a lot of unhealthy relationships in the culture that we came out of. And it was people that were pursuing works mentality to try to earn favor with God. And, and I'm really sorry. I don't mean to sound like I'm criticizing. You know, there's, there's no perfect church, right? But, but we knew that that was what we would call now performance orientation, believing a lie that you're only going to be loved by God if you perform well. That's not how he operates, right? There's nothing you could do in the flesh. There's no works you could do to make him love you more. But like James said, but when you love him, you do want to work for him. You just want to do it from a healthy base. So when I, when I say pursue peace with all and do it on the highway of holiness, I'm trying to give you another key to say if we don't do that, we don't operate in that full emotional healthiness. This is what he's saying right here. He pursued us and brought us into a restored, healthy relationship with him through Christ. So I don't want to hold grudges with people. I don't want to let things linger. I want to have a zero balance. They don't owe me anything. I forgive them. I let them go. I pray for them. I hope there'll be a revival in their lives and they'll be restored. And many times we've seen that happen and people will come of their own volition and apologize. And part of it is because you didn't keep them in that prison of that shame. And then it says, he has given us the same mission, the ministry of reconciliation to bring others back to him. So if we're supposed to have a ministry of reconciliation, that means go in that extra mile. As much as it's within my power, I have to pursue peace with those people. If I don't, I could be like Joseph in, in the Old Testament, right? He knew there was going to be a famine in Israel, but he didn't send for his family. He wasn't pursuing them. And when you don't do that, God will bring them to you. If you don't go to get them, he'll bring them to you to remind you, you're not operating in a healthy relationship. You're still holding a grudge against your family. And that got healed. That was for him. And he said, you meant this for evil. God meant it for life. 
that many would be restored. So we just want to be real careful that we're not holding the power of God back because we're holding grudges in our heart and we have an impure fountain in our heart. We want pure fuel running through our fountain. It's central to our good news that God was in the anointed Jesus making things right between himself and the world. And this says in the prior verse that he's given us that same mission. All right, so then I'm going to look at Philemon. How many know the book of Philemon? It's a little short book, but it's powerful. It's commentary said, Paul's letter to Philemon is a letter written with one purpose to bring reconciliation between two brothers in Christ. Who are the two brothers? Do you remember? Philemon and Onesimus, right? Didn't think about naming my son Onesimus, but it was a Bible name. To bring reconcili reconciliation between these two brothers. And Paul is acting as that minister of reconciliation that he just told us God has given us all this, this mission. Now, again, I just want to set it up. So let's say you're on your job. It's a secular setting. The people don't know the Lord. And they're having a fight. And God says, I want you to bring reconciliation into this matter. And assuming you have the authority to do that and you're not stepping out. There's, there's probably a hundred different ways you could approach it. And remember it says in the Bible, wide is the road that leads to destruction, but narrow is the highway of holiness. Start thinking about it that way. Narrow is the highway of holiness. There's one really good way that God would want you to do it. And Paul shows us a really good example here. And, and it could look, you know, well, we'll just unpack it and you'll see. It's believed that Philemon was a wealthy house church leader in the city of Colossae. And that's where the Colossians, uh, letter to the Colossians comes from whose slave, Onesimus, stole from him and ran away. The fugitive, Onesimus, found himself imprisoned next to Paul. <laughs> Talk about a setup. He goes to jail, and he's with Paul in jail. All right, so, wow, what a coincidence. No, that's the, the plan of the Lord. And through the ministry of the Holy Spirit in jail, Paul leads his fellow prisoner to the Lord. And if any man be in Christ... Josh White is a new creation. So I'm not holding anything against Onesimus from what he did in the past. He's a new creation now. But Philemon doesn't know he's a new creation now. So Philemon is still thinking angry thoughts towards this slave who ran away and stole from him too. Right? So what is Paul? Paul has to think of what's the right way that I should approach this to appeal to my friend who's a house church leader. Right? Who could be harboring some resentment in his heart in a way that's affecting the, the, the church. So it says, even though I have enough boldness in Christ, Philemon, Paul is saying, I have enough boldness that I could command you to do what is proper, I'd much rather make an appeal because of our friendship. So right there, he's not pulling rank on him. There's a good lesson, right? And I know I've said it before, but if you didn't hear me, if you're a boss and you say, do you know who I am? That's like, you're dead. Like, the game over, right there. If you have to say that, they know who you are. You're the boss. You're on the org chart, right? And it's like those two uh, sailors that were going into a bar in, in London. They were, they were about to go in, and this guy walks out with the big uniform on, and he stumbles in, and they bump him. And the guy says, do you know who I am? And they said, uh-oh, we're really in trouble. We're lost, and he doesn't even know who he is. Okay, so... We don't want that. He knows who you are. Pulling rank means you don't have any other card. And there's no other arrow in your quiver. There's no appeal to the kindness. It's just, I'd much rather appeal to you because of our friendship than, than to exercise my authority. But, you know, people do exercise authority because it's easier. And they, they neglect the relationship side. And Paul's saying, I don't want to neglect the relationship side, even though I could. So here I am, an old man, a prisoner for Christ, making my loving appeal to you. This is the Passion Translation. It's on behalf of my child, whose spiritual father I became while here in prison. And that is Onesimus. And you can imagine when he's reading this letter, Onesimus is the one who brings him the letter. So he's probably not thrilled to see him when he comes back and he gets this letter. And now there's that devil and the angel on the, on the shoulders of Philemon like, ah, you stole from me, you ran away. And Paul's now saying that he, he, he got you saved in prison? <laughs> I hate when that happens. I want to be mad at you. But now he's telling me I can't be mad at you. So here he's, wow, Paul is saying that 
He's my very heart. Onesimus is my very heart. And I've sent him back to you with this letter. I would have preferred to keep him at my side so that he could take your place as my helper <laughs> during my imprisonment for the sake of the gospel. However, I did not want to make this decision without your consent. <laughs> so that your act of kindness would not be a matter of obligation, but you're going to smile when you send him back. No, it's about the heart, right? Like Paul's, I really don't think Paul's trying to be manipulative here. He's just trying to show him, like, which is the better option, man? Should, should he stay in prison or should, now that he's a new creation in Christ, should he be on our side and be working and advancing the kingdom? What better option could there have been that he got saved? He's not going to be stealing anymore. He's my son in the Lord. And perhaps... Paul is saying to Philemon, perhaps you could think of it this way. He was separated you from a short time so that you could have him back forever. Free. You know, the, that's the implication here. So welcome him, no longer as a slave, but more than that, as a dearly loved brother. He is that to me especially, and how much more to you, both humanly speaking and in the Lord, so if you consider me your friend and partner, accept him the same way that you would accept me. And if he has stolen anything from you, he owes you nothing. Just put it on my account. He's knocking all the, b the boulders out of the way here, isn't he? And then he says, I promise to pay you back everything to say nothing of the fact that you owe me your very life. <laughs> In case you forgot, I just thought I'd remind you and would you do one thing for me, one more thing for me? <laughs> I'm hoping your prayer, by your prayers, I'm sorry, through your prayers, to be restored to you soon. So please prepare a guest room for me. <laughs> so any kind of grumbling going on in Philemon's spirit, the, the word of the Father, the word of his covering just came in and helped realign him. And it's so valuable to be in alignment with people and to voluntarily submit yourself to other people's authority who you trust. And if you don't have that, there's a big opening in your immune system. You need to have somebody that if they called you up and said, I'm concerned about something, and if they told you something and you would just say, no way, you're wrong, that's a problem. Right? You, you know, I'm not saying that they're going to be right 100% of the time, but you at least want to be able to hear what they have to say and consider it, right? Like that's super, super valuable. And if you think about the need for community and the isolation that's happened during the last two years, this idea of being accountable and being together and, and allowing ourselves to live life with each other has dwindled. And people are more and more isolated. And they're living in the metaverse with goggles on 24-7. Not, that's not the kingdom. Seek first the kingdom of God. Co completely crucial to seeking first the kingdom of God is being in fellowship, live bodies one with another, praying with one another, laying hands on one another, and, and looking each other in the eye, not in some fake version of you on the Internet. And then he says, oh, this is just like whatever. Drop the mic, Paul. May the unconditional love of the Lord Jesus, the anointed, be with you. And be with your spirit. So you don't even have a shot to hold a grudge against this guy anymore because he's one of us now. You with me? Say yes. All right, so I want to just give you another tool that we've used here before in this class, but we haven't done it in a really long time, so it'll be a good refresher. Could be people online that are watching for the first time. And it's just a way to think about our relationships and to think about the benefit that we have because we know each other and we live together. And, and we can tell if something, if, I, if Tom walks in, I, I'm with Tom enough to know that something might be bothering you. And I could put my arm around your shoulder and say, is everything okay? Is something you need to pray about, want, want to talk about, or unpack, or, or whatever. I mean, so many people don't have that. And they're dying on the inside because of that. So let's just start here. Can you all see that? clearly enough, because you, you have it on your handout too. So, so this first box is meant to talk about the things in my life. When I'm alone, it's, it's the part of me that I'm aware of and the part of me that I'm unaware of. Okay, so the, the part that I'm aware of, he's labeling as the arena, and the part that I'm unaware of is called the blind spot. As soon as you don't say you have a blind spot, you have revealed your ignorance. <laughs> 
Because we all have one, and that's why it's called the blind spot, right? And the beautiful thing about being in community is a, a friend of yours will come and give you a piece of gum and say, hey, do you want a piece of gum? Like, take this, please. That means you have bad breath, and you don't know it. You're unaware. It was a blind spot. But everybody wins when you chew that gum. <laughs> And then there's you, okay? So there's me on the top, and then there's you on the side, and that's, there's a part of me that you're aware of, right? That would still be in that arena. And that's what we both think we know about each other. And I just put that little qualifier on there. I could have said we know it about each other, but I don't even think we're fully aware what we think we know about ourselves sometimes, right? But it's the stuff that's out there that, you know, you know that I play the guitar and I'm a pastor of a church or, or whatever. It's the things that are obvious that we all know. But then there's other things that you can see because you're my friend. You can see what I can't see because it's my blind spot. And if you love me, you'll be like Paul. And you'll come to Philemon and, and you'll say, hey, man, look, this, is, this whole situation has changed. And you might be holding something against this guy that you don't have to hold. And I, and I value you, Joe. If you came to me and said that there's an issue that I think you should, that, that you should know about, you might not realize how it's coming across. I'm going to be all ears. I, am, I might not even agree with him when he says it to me, but I'll, because I have respect for him, I'm going to say, okay, I'm going to pray about it. I'm going to ask the Lord to show me what you're seeing. How valuable is this? That you have people that know the Lord, that you trust, that are hearing from God, that will speak into your life. So then there's these other two boxes on the bottom. And that's the part on the bottom left. It's the facade. And that's what you can't see that I'm hiding. I know it about myself, but I don't want you to know about it, probably because I'm ashamed of it. Or it could be that it's none of your business. <laughs> Right? Like, no, I mean that. Like, that's not, that's not in a bad way. It's like, you don't have to reveal everything to everyone about everything. Right? So there's just, it, the, the word facade would imply that we're hiding something that we could let, be let known. So I just want to, people have said over the years, there's such a thing as oversharing too, right? You could be more transparent than you have to be. So I'm just saying, it, let's just focus on the part that you could reveal, but you're afraid that they're going to think less of you. But that's a sign that you don't really put much weight on that relationship, right? Because if they really know you and they love you, they're going to. They're going to be okay with that. Because nobody's perfect, right? Even in churches. Amazing, isn't it? <laughs> right. Like, we could just admit it. We're just, we want to be those kind of people. And then that last one, that's what God sees that neither one of us see about either one of us. So there's that unknown part that we should be asking him for. What do you want of me, God? What do I need to be working on? How can I be more like you? What area of my life needs some deconstruction and reconstruction into your image? What can be torn down that, that has worked but has not been the optimal thing that you wanted for me? And, and we're not going to band-aid things. We, he was a carpenter, right? So he takes it down and rebuilds a better version. All right, so... What I want to do, if it's me and Josh that are friends here, is I want to, I want to lose a little bit of that facade, and I'm going to be more transparent with Josh and say, you know, we've known each other for a while, and there's a part of my life I haven't told you about, but I value your friendship, I value your prayers, and, and I'm going to self-disclose. And I'm going to also say, as our, as our friendship is unfolding, I, I, I give you permission to speak into my life if you see something. I'm, I'm soliciting your feedback. So don't say... Oh, I don't want to step over any kind of boundaries because I'm telling you I want it. I, I need you. And I am telling you that, Josh, in front of everybody. Just go ahead. Let it rip, man, whatever you say. Because <laughs> I do trust Josh, and, and we are friends. But I'm, this might sound really silly, but there's a lot of people that don't have these kind of relationships in their life. And the church is built around these kind of relationships. And when we were serving food yesterday, uh, one of the things that Stella Martinez, Reyes' wife, said was we were praying the, the prior week, and there was a big, long line. There was probably 40 people waiting, mostly moms with their kids. Sometimes it looked like the grandmother, the mother, and then the kids were there. And Stella said, hey, in, in Spanish, she said to the people, let's remember that as Latin American people, we respect our elders, so the, we're going to let the, the older people go first. And everybody turned and looked, and they said, yeah, you come on up. See, that was a part of their culture that they all understood. 
Even though they're in America, they all had that in common with each other, see? And it was built into their culture that we honor that older generation. Beautiful thing, right? So, what about us? The longer we can stay isolated, the more the, the culture tries to, to do those things for us. That's not how it's supposed to be. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all the other things that you need will be added unto you. And, and joining a ministry and serving a ministry often can be a way that, that God will work out things for you in, in the operating of the ministry that you're a part of. You'll learn so many lessons about how life works. It's incredible. You'll, you'll often be surprised how much revelation you'll get from people when you self-disclose and you solicit feedback from them. Awesome, right? So I said, when this works well, what happens? Christine. Oh, no. A pop quiz. Yeah. Yeah, vulnerability, trust, and connection. All the way of saying we become more emotionally healthy. Right? That's the goal, is to be more like Jesus. Right? That's, that's the ultimate goal, to be transformed into his image with ever-increasing glory. So all these classes that we're talking about, discernment and, and discerning spirits and, and looking for the roots of systems that might be in our life that are corrupted, that need to be set, we need to be set free of, it has to do with elevating the, the quality, the understanding of our personality be in line with Jesus and to be emotionally healthy. Right? So I said, it's, it's a new you and a part of your heart. All right, so, so whatever this thing was that was in Philemon's heart got healed because Paul took the time to speak into his life about Onesimus. And it's not like your whole heart completely transforms and, you know, that's how some people would take that verse. I'm a new creation. All things have passed away. All things have become new. All things have become new in, in the fact that we're living inside this new relationship now. But he still said to pick up your cross daily. So that means there's going to be an ongoing process. And we shouldn't despise the process. Amen? All right. So I'm going to turn you to another practical side here for a minute. And that's the handout. I'm not going to read the handout. I'll just give you some highlights of it. And, you know, the younger people here might not relate as much as I do because I was involved in finance all the way back into the 70s and 80s before anything to do with a computer. And some of you might have been there where you had to know how to use a, an adding machine to do a long list of numbers and you had to do it twice and run the tape and match the tape and if it wasn't the same answer, you had to do it again. So you had to show the boss two different runs, right? Now you could have made the same mistake twice, but the chances of that were, weren't very good. And they wanted you to go fast. So this man that we're gonna talk about, it's 1989. He's on the west coast, state of Washington, near Seattle, Issaquah, and his school system gets $2.7 million for computers. Please don't read the article, listen to me. I hesitated to give it to you because of this issue. <laughs> but you can read it when you get home, okay? The school gets $2.7 million. Now in 1989, that was a lot of money, a lot more than it would be today, but computers weren't what they are today either, right? So they were a lot more expensive. And they hire this consultant, his name is Mike Bookie, and he comes in, and, and his, advice is, his advice is to install a network for all the whole school system, which was multiple buildings in different towns within this school system, all right? And they didn't even know what a network was, and very few people did back in 1989. But this guy did. It says, after 20 years of working with computer networks, okay, that means he started in 1969, with computer networks. If you have any background in this, I see Tom's nodding. That was a real forerunner. Turns out this guy was the first one to ever have a working email system, right? So yeah, he was way ahead of his, of his, of his time. And, and it was the network idea that I'm trying to help underline here because Philemon was in a network. Paul was, was his leader, right? Something happens, Paul was able to weigh in. We're in that same kind of network together. An individual computer is good, but it multiplies, the value of it multiplies phenomenally when it's connected to other computers. But they didn't know that. So when they asked the teachers what they wanted, they wanted VCRs. Remember those? Because they could just pop in a VCR in front of the class. And, and yeah, it's better than nothing, but it's not nearly as good as what we now have, right, with the Internet. So he called it Cars in the Jungle. Anybody ever heard of this example before? 
So he said, hey, you know, if, if, you brought, if you dropped a car down in the middle of a jungle and the tribe that was there saw it, they'd go, oh, my God, this is amazing. Look at this. It's got lights at night. We could, we could turn on the lights until the battery dies. And when it rains, we can be covered. We can be protected from the animals in here, never knowing that the whole thing was designed to be on a highway, right, to get you somewhere, not to just sit still. And that's what a computer by itself is doing once you connect it to other other machines, the value of it just skyrockets, right? So they, this is what happens. Uh, I'm going to go back again in time. Anybody remember Two Sir with Love? Wasn't that a great movie? So this guy comes in. He's all excited. He wants to be a teacher, and he goes into the teacher's lounge, and what does he see? A bunch of disgruntled teachers, and they're like, yeah, we used to be excited like you. Don't worry. In a couple years, you won't care about the kids anymore either, remember? And it's like, no, he cared to serve with love. He actually changed their lives. It's an amazing story, right? So that's what happens. He go, this, this consultant comes in, and he, he's trying to give them advice. And, and the school, the first thing they say is, oh, that'll never work. If we do VCRs, it'll be easy. But you're telling us we're going to need a whole large IT department and, and, and just to keep the network running. So this is what people do. They think of all the reasons why they shouldn't change instead of all the reasons why they should then as the teachers were quick to point out to Bookie, there was the, say it with me, the problem of the students. Impulsive, mischievous, and messy. They were not like the corporate employees that he was used to working with. Speaking from grim experience, the teacher said the plan would only succeed if the computers were reserved for the teachers and if all the students were barred entirely. Paying attention, Sebastian, this is for you. There was a kid named Lee Dumas, 13 years old. He's, he's sitting where you're, you guys are sitting, and they're all looking at computer screens, learning how to use these computers, and the teacher walks into the back. All of your screens are green, but his screen is red because he figured out how to hack into the server, and he was changing his grades. <laughs> he was about to get in to where he was the admin, and he could give himself straight A's. I think that's pretty smart, right? Like, it's completely illegal and devious, but it's showing a spark of something in there, right? It's just criminal. So he hacks the network. The teachers prior to this had been calling him brain dead. Mm. So the, the administrator comes and catches him and says, hey, maybe instead of being the outlaw, you should be the sheriff. Does that sound like salvation? Does that sound like a guy who was a criminal or who was lost and doing drugs and just needed a family? And instead of going to a gang, they came into a church and they got loved by the church and now all of a sudden they have a purpose for their life. To the school administrators, kids like Lee Dumas might be a problem, but to this guy, Bookie, Issaquah's 9,000 students seemed like a wonderfully cheap resource. By training the students to build and maintain the networks, he could make the $2.7 million an enduring educational resource. In the end, the Issaquah network was almost entirely built by the students between the ages of 12 and 17. All right, so Mario Marullo is talking to people like Lee Dumas all the time. The world has kind of rejected them they're doing drugs, they're bikers, whatever. And he brings them into the tent and he tells them there's no better option than Jesus. And, and they come up there and, and he's like, you people in the churches that don't want us to come, you're filling seats that could have a drug addict in it. And, and that's a shame because these people are, are going to end up becoming the pastors of the churches that lead the revival of the future. Because they're going to see the reality of God deliver them from drugs. We as the church need to keep our eyes open to hurting people that have great potential but are just being missed by other people. Like this kid Lee Dumas, who you can read it. It's really cool the way it worked out. It says, having just fin as at the time this article was being written, which is a long time ago in the early 90s, having just finished his sophomore year, Dumas has gone to work this summer at Microsoft. The once brain-dead punk is considered a valued employee with high praise promise for his future. The student who floundered in the usual education system flourished when his individual 
talent, his gift was recognized, his specialization was discovered. We can be doing this after church over at the commons area over coffee and bagels. We can be speaking to somebody and speaking to the Lord and saying, Lord, what do you see about this person that nobody else has seen about them? How can I speak into his future? How can I meet him during the week and, and grab a cup of coffee and just speak life into him? And then it says, last summer he got a job at the computer store in Seattle teaching his Macintosh hypercard program to a student body consisting of public school teachers. Not so brain dead. And I love this expression. It says, teachers should increasingly abandon their role as sage on the stage in favor of service as guide on the side. That's, that, that could be a pastor. A sage on the stage, all the revelation, and you poor people down there, you just need all this stuff poured into you all the time. No. It's guide on the side. It's coming alongside people. It's encouraging them. It's lifting them up. It's speaking life into them when, they're, when their own head is telling them, this isn't going to work. I could really go a long time on that one. I won't. So let's just finish with this one, okay? That's the other one that says uh, language learner. So how do I summarize this, what we've talked about so far? We are made in the image of God. Since God thinks that we're the most valuable thing on the planet, we should think other people are the most valuable thing on the planet. And that means we can't judge them. Doesn't mean everything's okay. Doesn't mean everything they do is fine, but they're fine. Because they got to know that most of what they're dealing with is just a counterfeit way of dealing with the stress and the problems they're in. Most drugs are just taken because there's so much pain, they don't have any other out. So they... What they brilliantly do here on this chart, and I'll go through it quickly, is just compare what it's like to learn a new language with getting healed, with the process of healing. And I'm sure there's somebody here whose original language was English and then they learned Spanish, or their original language was Spanish and then they learned English. And what everybody has said, excuse me, over the years, if I started with English and I'm learning Spanish, as I'm learning, I have to translate everything into the language I'm trying to learn. But then I reach a point called fluency when I don't have to translate it anymore and I can think in English and I can think in Spanish. Well, what about thinking in, in natural world versus kingdom world? The kingdoms of this world become the kingdoms of our God. What if I could be so fluent in the language of Jesus that I don't have to translate? That's what prophets do. The prophets just want to be in that open heaven and what they hear, they translate. There's musicians that are fluent, okay, that they don't have to have a chord chart in front of them. If they hear it in their head, they don't have to think about it. It just flows. They're so fluent in their gift that they think it and play it. Boy, would I like to get there. I'm thinking all the time. I'm blowing fuses all the time. So what do they say? There's a stage one in the language learner. You're, you're just going through the motions. You're just listening to what they're telling you to repeat these phrases. You don't hear your mistakes. You have a limited, limited ability to take in the new information. And, and you're learning that pattern, the basic pattern, a sound system, and just enough to get by. And I'm doing this right now because I'm talking to people that are calling me on the phone for the food pantry and they're speaking Spanish at 900 miles an hour. And I'm like, whoa, 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 slow down, slow down, slow down. And then I call Sebastian or Topi and, and you're like, okay, we got this. Don't hurt yourself, Pastor. You'll be all right. So I'm learning a little bit at a time. I'm getting there. But I'm just survival vocabulary totally. Instructor corrects only the mistakes which hinder the message, right? So you just want them to get their repetitions down and start learning the phrases. On the Christian healing side, we don't recognize the mistakes that we're making. So if we're talking to a counselor, we might just start dropping F-bombs because we're newly saved. And that's, you know, I never even thought about it. I, I just cursed all the time. And now that I'm a Christian, I don't even know that that's a sin. I'm making that up, but that, hap that does happen. Don't comprehend that the wounds that you have inside are driving these hurtful behavior patterns. You haven't made the connection between your behavior and the wounds that happened in your life. And you might not discern the patterns of behavior and thoughts, what we would call tracking what's happening up on the surface, the fruit, back to the root of whatever happened to you as a kid, let's just say. Right? So the counselor, the pro this is us. Remember, earlier I said we are all being made ministers of reconciliation. 
So you can't say, well, that's not my thing. That's not my calling. No, because as a Christian, you're, you're representing the kingdom of God. So at a minimum, we should all be good listeners. We should all know our Bible. We should all be able to, to, to put an arm around somebody and counsel at a basic level on what the Bible says. <coughs> Excuse me. So what does the counselor do? Just like the language learner, the counselor is careful to reveal only what the person needs in order to begin the healing process and doesn't bring shame on the person, doesn't overload them. Come back tomorrow with four chapters memorized from the book of Romans. So I don't even know where the maps are in the Bible, right? Is it important to read the Bible? Of course it is, but you have to meet the person where they're at. And every person is going to be at a different place. And, and that's where you want to look for their strengths and then also look for the areas that they have to improve on. So then it says transition to stage two, which I like because it doesn't just go automatically from one to two. There's this transition stage. So the person learning the language, they start to hear the mistakes. They know the rules and the pronunciations, but the structures aren't stable. They can speak, but accurate production is hit and miss. And the instructor encourages the learner to what? Stay immersed. Church on Sunday, church on Wednesday, listen to worship music during the week. There's a lot going on there that you don't even realize it's going on, but it's going in your spirit, right? And by listening to Christian things, you're not listening to worldly things. And when coming to church, and then we had a lady named Dot Sims that used to be a greeter. And the main thing people said when she passed away was, oh, my God, am I going to miss that smile? Because you couldn't get past Dot. She would just intercept you and hug you. It was awesome, right? Remember? What a gift that was. Even when all the senses are being assailed, the language learner is not making sense. You stay, you stay immersed in it. And similarly, in that transition to stage two, as a Christian in our healing process, we start to see the wounds and we begin to understand that there are destructive life patterns, but we don't have the power yet to stop the behavior. And in some ways, that is scary, right? Because we see it now, but we can't stop it. We're able to explore the problems with direction and to counsel their comforts, but also now gently encourages the person to stay with the process, even though issues aren't clear and it could feel like a little too much to that person right in that moment. But hang in there, folks, right? Because you're going to get to stage two. And, and look, it's funny, right? Because even though you're, you, in, you were in transition, you get to stage two, but the first thing they say is frustration because you start to realize, man, this is going to take longer than I was hoping it was going to take. Learning another language takes a long time, especially to get fluent in it, right? Unstable structures, tempted to quit because I think I should be further along, and possible depression, physical ailments or despair brought on by learning fatigue. And it says right there, stage two is the most difficult. And look, if you're here from another country and you have to stay here, you can't go back and you have to learn the language, that's an extra level of pressure that could make it even harder to learn because you're trying so hard, you just you break down with fatigue. It says most, most difficult part of, of learning the language. And for us as people that want to be ministers of reconciliation but also walk through healing ourselves because nobody ever arrives at perfectly healed. Yes? I'm supposed to say amen about that. Anybody here arrive? No, right? So okay, so then, then maybe I could learn something from this too. Because I could always be more fluent in Jesusology or whatever we want to call it, in the character and the heart of Jesus. So as we're trying to walk through this healing process, stage two is frustrating. It can be overwhelming, tempted to stop due to struggles with now you know the right thing to do and you're in this match where you where you can stop sometimes, but other times you're not, and you battle with impatience over the time and the process that 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 the process takes and feeling stupid and feeling rebellious or guilt over the stress that we're putting on our family and friends. And again, same thing as, as learning a language. It's the most difficult part. We knew that, Trisha and I did when we started this. We didn't have this language for it per se, but we were like, it's okay. You know, what happens when you start a church, you need a lot of people to help you. If you want to have a lot of ministries, you need a lot of people. And we said, you know what? What's the point of rushing? We, we might have a bunch of different ministries, but if the people in it are all feeling crushed by all this pressure, it's not going to be the love of God operating, is it? Let's just grow slow. Who cares if we don't have 15 things in the beginning? Whatever we do have, at least there'll be 
will, will be working with people from their gifting and because they want to be there and not because they're having to live up to some rat race, like keep turning up the speed of the, uh, what do they call that thing? I can't remember it now. When you run on a treadmill. It's like you're always dangling the thing a little bit out of reach for people. And, man, that's a horrible way to live. All right? You, you, you good with me? I've only got, only got two more things to do here, right? Transition to stage three. Now you're starting to move. You've, you've come over the hill, and you're starting to go downhill with the language, and you're developing by decrees. You're getting clearer pronunciation, stable structure, adequate vocabulary with less and less need for concentration. You can self-correct with relative ease. And on, on our side with the healing process, you become increasingly familiar with the new and appropriate things. Oh, that's right. I'm not supposed to drop an F-bomb right now. And I've got through enough of those where I'm not doing that anymore. And once in a while, I'll think it, but I won't say it. Still a sin. Ooh, sorry. <laughs> Becomes increasingly familiar with what, what I should be doing. <laughs> Develops the ability to stop bad behavior after it has begun. All right, so before, you had no ability to stop it. Now it gets rolling, and you say, no, I know I'm not supposed to do that. And then when you get to stage three, this is fluency, okay? On the language side, this is fluency. You're able to incorporate language as a second nature. You may revert to old habits when you're under stress or tired, but fluency is not lost. Instructor directs the students to disciplines which will maintain fluency consistent with writing and speaking, okay? Now on our side, this is so powerful. Oh, it allows God's ways to become second nature to us. If you think of nothing else, if we could just understand what a goal that would be, that we live our lives in such a way. I remember Corey Ten Boom, when they were drilling, because they knew that the Nazi guards were going to eventually come and raid that place, and they would wake each other up in the middle of the night and say, where are you hiding? Where are you hiding the Jews? And they had to train themselves that even if they got woken up in the middle of the night with no warning, there's no Jews here, even though they were right behind the wall in her bedroom. Right? So that's second nature. That's where you, you've, you've incorporated, you've metabolized it so much, you would not sin under that situation. Sexual sin arises. It's second nature. I'm running out of this room like Joseph did. There's no way that's going to happen. You'd have to kill me before I would ever commit adultery with that woman. Right? That's second nature. Allows God's ways to become second nature, able to stop behavior before the feelings arise. And then they could remain fluent even in the face of severe trial. That was Joseph, man. I'll tell you what. Right? Still interpreting dreams. Still operating in excellence where they make him, they, they put him in charge of the prison. If anybody could have shut down, right? He didn't. He still kept operating in excellence. Excellence, sorry. Counselor encourages the counselee to employ the disciplines of the Lord. So that's where the church attendance comes in. Worship, music small groups holding each other accountable. And, and then what it says at the bottom, I'll just summarize here. It says, if the language students return to a place in which they will be saturated in the original or the old language, they may experience severe setbacks and fluency. So what does that mean for us? If I came out of the drug scene, if I came out of bar scene, if I'm a musician and I go five years and I'm playing in Christian, only in Christian bands and then all of a sudden I'm on vacation somewhere and I spend a week out at night with friends that aren't saved and I'm going back into the bars again? You know how quick that stuff rises back up again? Especially when you were the one up there playing and, and oh my God, so many ripple effects of that. Stay out of that place. Severe setbacks. Are we allowed to do it? We're free. You're, you're free to walk in there, but should you do it? Think about it. Like, what would, be, what would be God's will in that situation is to stay holy, right? Stay out of a place that could start to drag you back down again. They must continue to stay in the new. The language learners here, but it's the same for us. And the symptoms of the onset of this critical period, our students are convinced they'll never learn. In the face of what they feel is a, a lack of progress. And, and they're convinced that the instructor thinks they're hopelessly stupid we don't think that, okay? If you're, people would say to us, how come this is taking so long? I thought I knew more than this. I thought I, I would be, be in a better place than I am right now. I'm still struggling with this thing. Well, 
I don't know the answer to that. It's not like you're not trying, but there's a stronghold in there and doesn't want to let go. And we're going to continue to work with you, okay? It's not like, it's not like there's some time limit on this thing. We're going to be working with each other for the rest of our lives. That's what we do. That's, that's what we're here for. And, well, I'll tell you what, when you get a little bit of revelation about how much further there is to go for yourself, it's a lot harder to judge other people when they're dealing with something, right? Because we're all in some level of, of recovery and, and re renewal and growth into the character of Christ. Almost done. This can be extremely tiring, and that's why we need each other to walk through it. And it becomes just before an emotional and psychological breakthrough, all right? So often, right, that's what they'll say, that it gets dark before the dawn, but boy, hang in there because your breakthrough's coming. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. You push through, push through, push through. It looks like nothing's happening. Bam, you get your breakthrough. And that's what we're all believing for. So I just want to end with this prayer. So if we could stand up together and... If anybody could stay and pray, and anybody on our prayer ministry team could stay and pray. Um, there's, there's really two ways I would think that we could apply this tonight. First of all, if you're still dealing with something, no problem with that. We're happy to pray with you for that. But also you could just say, can you pray for me to be more aware of the needs and the people that are in my world, the people that I come across all the time, because I want to be a little bit more intentional about reaching out and trying to help them. I want, I want to let God use me to be a minister of reconciliation for other people. All right, so can we say it out loud? Can you see it? A little louder, yes? Can you see it? All right, so ready? Lord, I ask you to come in a way that feels safe. Please lift away any fearful perceptions of you. Let your presence here be a bomb to my wounded heart, the battered spirit. All right, so if we're reluctant, to, to lean into this, if, if we're feeling a little fearful about stepping out to try to help somebody, like who am I to try to help somebody else? No, no, calm my heart down. I know you want to use me. And when I open my mouth, you said you would fill it, so I don't have to put all this pressure on myself that I've got to be perfect in the way I do this. All right, next one. Ready? Gently wash away the toxic, defiling deposits and apply your love to healing can happen from the inside out. Wrap me in your glory and righteousness so I can drink deeply of you, drawn from your strength and resting in you. So a lot of times when you're about to talk to somebody, the best thing to do is zip your lip. Just ask a question and let the person talk and just listen and ask the Lord, how do you want me to respond to this? What are you trying to show me through the words that are saying? What's going on between the lines of what they're saying? And man, if, you know, I, I don't know about you, but often people will say, I don't know why I'm telling you this, but I seem like I just trust you, right? And, and that's really powerful. Last one, or no, I'm sorry, next one. Jesus, I ask you to touch my spirit and cause it, I'm sorry, that's a misprint, cause it to be knit together in such a way that it can contain all the strength, truth, and healing that you desire. Take away all thoughts of vengeance. They were a false comfort. And teach me what true comfort is. So that's it. Lord, we just thank you that as we, as we submit ourselves to this process, that we're going to recognize those kids like the one that hacked into the computer. Instead of putting them in jail, we're going to see potential in them. We're going to recognize that what everybody else thought was a problem turned out to be to the solution to the problem. And we're going to not be in such a rush to think that we're not keeping up with some timeline that we should be further along than we are. We're going to be recognize where we are and we're going to move forward from where we are. And we're going to look at each other for help. We're going to look to each other for help and recognize that the gift that you've given us of the people around us is one of the greatest gifts you've given us is the body of Christ, other believers, people we can live life with and grow with and speak into but also have them speak into us. Lord, I just thank you for the power of community that you give us in the kingdom of God. And I pray that, that we all would grow into fluency not having to go to translate anything, but to know your will so perfectly that it will flow out of us like a second nature. In Jesus' name.